Everyone will please have a seat. We'll get going here. Try to stay on schedule. Close to schedule. In our quest to find evidence of ancient knowledge, we not only look at structures and mythology and astronomy and alignments and things like that, but uh, we're also starting to look more at linguistics and, and other areas that might reveal what the ancients knew. And our next speaker is someone who actually joined CPAC uh, three years ago and was, was in our private meetings there. And it took me a while to really understand the importance of his work but he's been studying the symbol of languages for over 15 years and I think what he has found is, is truly remarkable and it lends support to this idea that very ancient cultures knew something and then it was forgot and now it seems to be coming back. And so will you please join me in welcoming Scranton. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's really great to see so many people here. Uh, when you go home tonight, you'll remember that uh, you saw Robert Boval, Graham Hancock, and then some guy. <laughs> um, my, uh, my field of study is uh, comparative cosmology. You might see in some of the CPAC literature that I'm described as a Dogen cosmologist. And I want to just make it clear that that does not mean that I do the hair, nails, and makeup for an obscure African tribe. <laughs> um, co cosmology is the study of um, how the universe was created. And what I do is I look at ancient cosmologies of different cultures, compare their symbols and their myths their deities and their cosmological words and try to make sense, better sense of what the ancients were talking about through those comparisons. Uh, what I'm here for today is to talk to you about an alternate method of reading Egyptian hieroglyphs. Um, if you recall, back in 1822, our traditional method of reading hieroglyphs came out of a translation of the Rosetta Stone. There were three parallel texts. Um, one written in Egyptian hieroglyphs, one written in Demotic, and one in ancient Greek. And Champollion, building on the work of other people like Thomas Young, uh, was able to, to compare groupings of Egyptian glyphs to words that we understood in the other languages and produce a translation that was based on word equivalences. Um, my approach is not based on uh, parallel texts. It's based on symbols and meanings that come three parallel cosmologies. And what my studies have shown is that a lot of the Egyptian hieroglyphic shapes and meanings seem to evolve, have evolved out of a cosmology that existed before written language. And so what I'm going to do today is uh, try to walk, us, walk you all through how one of these Egyptian glyph shapes is evoked along with its traditional meanings in the cosmologies, and then show how those meanings play out in various Egyptian words. Um, I, it is not my intention to say that the traditional translations of the Egyptian hieroglyphs are wrong. Um, if I were to characterize the difference between the two approaches, I'd have to say that the traditional approach tells us what an Egyptian word means. Uh, the alternate approach tells us why the word means what it means. Okay, uh, my discussion today is based on um, concepts that are expressed more in my two books, The Science of the Dogon and Sacred Symbols of the Dogon, uh, both of which are available in the bookstore, the CPAC bookstore. Uh, the second book is available for the first time today, thanks to 
a sort of Herculean, Herculean effort on the part of the publisher and the CPAC people to get the books here. They had to be shipped directly from the printer to CPAC to be here on time. I actually saw the book for the first time this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get to a position where I can see the, the slides here. Um, okay, the Dogen, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with them, are an African tribe, a modern day African tribe, um, who live in northwest Africa, in Mali, just below um, Algeria and Morocco. They're a cliff dwelling people who live in the desert, and outwardly they, they are very primitive. They don't have technology. Uh, they have um, withstood assimilation to other cultures for many, many, many years. Um, let's see, uh, the, part of the reason why the Dogen are important is because they share many um, things in common with ancient Egypt. They have cultural um, similarities to ancient Egypt and religious similarities to um, Judaism. And they have um, cosmological similarities to ancient Buddhism. So they represent sort of a crossroads of three different traditions. Seems like a pretty good place to start um, to explore cosmology. Um, another big advantage of studying the Dogen is that while you can't sit an Egyptian priest down and ask him questions about his religion, you can sit an, uh, a Dogen priest down and ask him questions and get straight answers. Um, so we, we know, we have documented directly out of the mouths of Egyptian priests um, what their symbols mean, cosmological words mean, and a lot of their a lot of their myths and their symbols line up with ancient Egypt. Um, there are many many reasons to think that there is a connection between the Dogon and ancient Egypt. Uh, no one has actually proved, has, no one's been able to actually demonstrate that the Dogon evolved from the Egyptians. But as we look at uh, examples of things they have in common, it becomes apparent that the Dogen seem to have been connected to Egypt sometime very, very early in ancient Egy Egyptian history. Uh, for example, the Dogen have, um, wh where the Egyptians have um, gods who emerge in pairs, the Dogen have ancestors who emerge in pairs with the same attributes. Uh, they haven't risen to the level of actual god status yet. Uh, where the Egyptians have written symbols, the Dogen have cosmological drawings that take many of the same shapes, carry many of the same meanings. And so it's as if the Dogen system of cosmological drawings um, existed before the emergence of written language in Egypt. The Dogen have no written language. Um, the Dogen also have um, many similarities that we would expect to see with pre-dynastic tribes. Um, if, if they really were connected with Egypt very early on, then we should see, we should be able to predict certain things about the pre-dynastic tribes based on what we see among the Dogen. Uh, Helene Hagen wrote a book called The Shining Ones, which documents um, important uh, cosmological words as they existed among the Amazigi, who are the uh, grouping of pre-dynastic hunter tribes. Um, she traces symbols and words to ancient Egypt, uh, many of the same symbols and words that I look at in terms of the Dogen. Um, okay, um, one of the things that drew me to the Dogen is the fact that they, their cosmology is preserved in very great detail. And what their priests say is that the Dogen cosmology tells us how their tribal god created matter. Now what no one happened to notice along the way was that what the Dogen are describing and what they diagram is the real structure of matter. Uh, it took me, it took me uh, years of research because I didn't know that much about the scientific structure of matter, but I knew enough to recognize an atom and a, a proton, an electron, a neutron, and so forth. And I realized that the Dogen had these top level symbols of matter right. And so I asked the question, is it possible that the, the, the further descriptions they give of matter could also be right? And when you, um, when you look at their descriptions and their drawings, my first book lays a foundation side by side, Dogen descriptions and drawings, to descriptions from Stephen Hawking and Brian Greene and scientific diagrams that come from atomic theory, quantum theory, and string theory. And the Dogen have the structure 
completely right, top to bottom. Um, when it comes down to the level of string theory, I should probably say that the comparison is really probably more exact to something called torsion theory, um, which John Deering could probably tell us about. Um, it's very similar to string theory, but has some differences. OK, now, in, in addition to describing these components of matter in their mythological structure of matter, the Dogen um, typically provide us with a supporting drawing. And when they get down to the level of, a, of what would be an electron, the drawing they give us, which they say is a picture of a nest, looks almost exactly like an electron microscope picture of an electron orbit, orbital shape in science. And the, the kind of, of correlation in, um, in symbols that we find fairly typically, um, very, very strong, very easy to recognize. There was no attempt to hide anything. It's not like the symbols have been disguised. They're just sitting right out there for somebody to look at and see. OK, many of the Dogen shapes that are these cosmological drawings uh, also take the same shape as Egyptian hieroglyphs. And so when I finished writing the first book, I realized that the Dogen had provided me with 30 glyph shapes or 30 cosmological shapes that looked an awful lot like Egyptian shapes. And in many cases, carried the same meanings as the Egyptian shapes or turned up written in Egyptian words that had the same meaning as the Dogen cosmological word. Like if you go to the Egyptian word, root word for the word nest, you find the glyph on the right, um, which is what I would expect to find in the Dogen drawing. So I realized that I could predict, based on what the Dogen said, what I was going to find in ancient Egypt in, in language. Um, and I can predict it based on similarity of pronunciation of the word, based on uh, typically two or more levels of meaning of the word, and based on the shape of the cosmological drawing that they drew. OK, Dogen cosmology is uh, founded on um, a ritual aligned structure that they build. Uh, Graham was talking uh, about um, structures that have built aligned align to certain positions, certain star um, alignments and so forth. The Dogen granary is aligned to the four cardinal points, which means it's defining north, south, east, and west. And uh, the granary is a symbolic structure. And what I mean by that is that what's important about it is not what they use the structure for. What's important about it is symbolism that they assigned to each of the stages of construction. And so if an initiate in the Dogen religion, which is a, a sort of a secret tradition among the Dogen, if an initiate can remember how to build a structure, then they can recreate the key elements of their own cosmology simply by building the structure. Um, what we know about the Dogen and about Dogen cosmology was given to us, it was documented by two French anthropologists in the 1950s. Um, a gentleman by the name of Marcel Griol, who died suddenly in 1956, and his student, Germain Dieterlin, who finished their anthropological study of the religion. Um, researchers who followed Marcel Griol in uh, studying the Dogen in the 1980s couldn't create, could not recreate uh, Marcel Griol's findings, even though Griol said that they were, it was a secret tradition. These other uh, researchers, anthropologists, came in, and when they when they were not privy to the same secrets, said, well, look, we, we can't recreate the findings. Somebody must have invented this. This is fabricated. And they first accused the Dogen priests of having fabricated the religion, and later on implied that Marcel Griol himself had fabricated the religion. And that was partly based on the idea that, that um, no one had, could verify anything about the Dogen granary except Marcel Griol. What nobody noticed for 50 years was that the Dogen grain ring is a stupa. A stupa is a ritual aligned structure that's built in, uh, across India and Asia and has been documented to be built according to the same base plan and evokes all of the same symbolism as the Dogen granary, step for step, point for point, symbol for symbol. And so it's really not possible that a Dogen priest could have fabricated Buddhism. It, <laughs> And it's not very likely that Marcel Griol would have um, passed, tried to pass off Buddhism as if it were Dogen cosmology. OK, the, the pyramid, um, 
pyramids in the Americas and in Egypt have many things in common with the Dogen granary. Um, for instance, the door of the granary opens uh, two-thirds of the way up the north side. Um, there's extended symbolism about uh, a pyramid that you find in the Americas. Um, for instance, it's thought to represent uh, the concept of a womb. Um, it's conceptualized as a woman lying on her back. The four faces of the pyramid are associated with four star groups that are used to control uh, the agricultural cycle. And so, um, even though you might argue that two different cultures in wide, widely spread areas of the world might have an impulse to stack up blocks and build a pyramid, uh, that doesn't explain how this complicated symbolism have been attached to both, both um, pyramid structures, if it was just coincidence. Um, okay, so the key that I found to um, uh, trying to reinterpret Egyptian hieroglyphs comes out of the symbolism that is generated by the shapes as you build the stupa structure. And so that's where we're going to start in terms of trying to understand an Egyptian symbol. Um, to get to the bottom of it, we have to go to the bottom of, or what I consider to be the conceptual bottom. Whoops. We've lost uh, power here. Can, uh, looks like we're going for help out there. Okay, at the bottom of the, uh, the cosmology in, for the Doga, for the Buddhists, is a shape that's called the egg and the ball. It's a circle, a large circle with a smaller circle inside it. And the circle is divided in two with, um, with intersecting lines at right angles. Um, the egg in the ball is also called the picture of Ama. Ama is the name of the, the Dogon god. And it's also called the womb of all world signs. And this is, this is the starting point. Uh, both the Dogon and the, the Buddhists associate this circular shape with the smaller circle in the center of it with the sun. And so essentially what it is is it's the Egyptian sun glyph shape. Um, that's the starting point for the cosmology. Um, Dogen, for the Dogen, the structure of matter begins um, with 266 primordial seeds or signs, which correlate to uh, more than 200 fundamental particles discovered by science. And these seeds or signs begin in the egg and the ball, and they're grouped into groupings. Uh, there uh, two master signs, uh, sorry, two, two guide signs, eight master signs, and 256 world signs. And the two guide signs are considered to be Ama, who is the god. Um, the eight master signs emerge in pairs, like the Egyptian Ania gods, paired opposites. And each pair is associated with one of the primordial elements, water, fire, wind, and earth. And the, the pairs represent opposing aspects of water, fire, wind, and earth. And so you can correlate it creates a structure that you can correlate to the Aeneid gods and goddesses in Egypt um, and try to explain how is it that the Egyptian gods and goddesses emerge the way they do with the attributes that they have. Um, it would help a lot if we could get the power back on the screen. Do we have Jeff? Okay, dance, tap dance, right? <laughs> Walter, we need, we've lost power somehow to the screen. We'll get you some light. Uh, Laird does play guitar, by the way. It might be a good time to break it out. <laughs> this appears to be a UCSD issue with the uh, projector up on this side, so we've called for technical assistance. Okay, that's great. Um, you can really only do it by inference. Um, you, one way of judging, one easy way of judging is to ask yourself, 
what, the, what is known to have existed among the pre-dynastic tribes, what is known to have existed in Egypt, and what did the Dogen have in, you know, in between. And so you shouldn't be able to make predictions from that and say, well, since the Dogen don't have this, the pre-dynastic tribe shouldn't have either. Um, and you can sort of uh, set up a, a priority that way and, and figure out which had to come first, which had to come second. And the indications just keep pointing again and again to the idea of the Dogen having um, been connected in some way with the Egyptians very, very early in Egypt. And when I say very early, I mean before the appearance of writing. Uh, this also implies that the cosmology existed before writing in Egypt. It means that meanings had been assigned to cosmological shapes before the appearance of writing in Egypt. And that what I'm going to show in the further slides is that Egyptian words are put together in such a way that someone deliberately considered what the meaning of the word was that they wanted to write, and then picked shape, glyph shapes that carried concepts that would allow them to write that word. For example, the Egyptian word for week is written with two glyphs, the sun glyph, which is a circle with a dot in the middle of it, and the number 10. Now, traditionally, the Egyptian sun glyph carries three meanings. It can mean it can represent the sun, it can represent the concept of a day, or it can, if it appears in a word, it can indicate a period of time. And so when a traditional Egyptologist looks at that word week, there really is almost no way that they can interpret the word except as saying, symbolically, 10 days. 10 days is the definition of an Egyptian week. So when I came across that word, I said, wow, this is really a remarkable word. I can tell by looking at the word what the Egyptian concept of a week was. What are the chances, I asked myself, that this is a fluke? There are really only two possibilities here. Either that word is a complete fluke and no other word works that way and this just happens to be something that you know, I'm going to have to accept. Or else the other possibility is that the other words also work the same way and that no one had a clear enough understanding what the glyph shapes meant to realize that the other words work this way. So I took that as a starting point and I started exploring other Egyptian words that had to do with concepts of time. Words like year, month, day, week, um, and words that related to concepts of, an, of the rotation of the earth or concepts of an orbit, like the word dawn. And what I discovered was that in every case, if you take the cosmological meaning for the, the glyph shapes, that you can see that the Egyptian word defines its own meaning. When you go to the Egyptian word for seasons, it reads three arcs of the Earth's orbit around the sun. I said three arcs, that, that confused me. You know, I was expecting four seasons. And so I went online and I did some research and sure enough, the Egyptians only observed three seasons. They had a planting season, a harvest season, and a rainy season. And so I actually learned a correct fact about ancient Egypt simply by looking at the word that expressed the concept. And since then, I've come to understand that the, the Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary um, works this way, that you can go to pretty much any word in the dictionary, and if you understand what the symbols represent, uh, come up with a very clear definition or a very clear explanation for why the word means what it means some problems with the approach. The first problem is that traditional Egyptologists don't know for sure how Egyptian words were pronounced. Um, and so over time, they have come up with um, reconstructions and extrapolations and so forth of, of how they feel the words were pronounced and um, what they felt the words meant and so forth. With the Dogen, we know how a word is pronounced. We know exactly how it's pronounced because we have it documented as it comes out of the mouth of a living Dogen priest. We know what the word means, how it's pronounced, and what meanings it carries. And uh, the Dogen cosmological words um, provide us with some interesting benefits. For instance, each of the important words carries at least two levels of meaning. And those two meanings are disconnected from each other by what I call a logical disconnect. The picture we saw on the screen of the glyph that represents the nest is conceptually an electron, but the second meaning they attached to it was the concept of a nest. Now, I've never seen a nest that looks like 
a four-looped flower. There's no bird that I know of that builds a nest that looks like that. There's no good reason why another culture ought to assign the, the meaning of nest to that shape. It's a logical disconnect. You can't get from the cosmological concept to the second meaning of the glyph through any logical inference. And so they've done this from top to bottom in the cosmology. They've given us the second level of meaning. And so now we can go to an Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary and see that they have two words pronounced like the Dogen words that express those exact two meanings with the exact same logical disconnect. And so no one can reasonably say that it's a coincidence. If they'd only gotten one meaning right, it's, uh, linguistically it's not valid to draw a, a, a correlation between two words based on similarity of pronunciation and one level of meaning. It's not enough evidence to, to demonstrate that the words are really related to each other. But when you start adding a second level of meaning and a drawn symbol that are associated with the same word, now you're in a position, it's, it's the equivalent of having um, four eyewitnesses to uh, a crime. If they're all saying the same thing, you can pretty much argue effectively that there is a relationship here, even, though, even if we can't say absolutely what the relationship is, very clearly there is a relationship. Um, when you're comparing two systems, the ability to predict aspects of one system based on details of another is the definition of a relationship. And so what I've tried to do, the approach I've tried to take in my books is not one of proof, it's one of demonstration. And a, an example I give is, imagine that you were a, a high school student and your five-year-old nephew decided to come visit you for the first time at the high school. And the nephew gets there and he says to you, you know, I think I can open your locker. I can open the lock to your locker. And you think, five-year-old kid, he can't open my locker. He's never been here before. He probably doesn't even know how a combination lock works. But the kid's insistent, and so you say, well, it's not going to hurt anything. Let him try. Go ahead, kid. Try to, try to open the lock. So you let him, you stand and watch as he turns the lock the right number of times right and the right number of times left and the right number of times right again and actually unlocks the locker. Now, it doesn't matter how much you protest or complain, the kid said he was going to open the locker, and then he opened it. That's the demonstration of knowledge. He knows what he said he knows. And so that's the approach I've taken with the Dogen, is they start out by saying, hello, everybody, I'm going to describe for you the structure of matter. And then, point by point by point by point, they lay out the correct structure of matter. No room for an argument there. <laughs> Um, John? That's interesting. Well, there's an easy way to, again, not disprove, but demonstrate that that can't be true. Carl Sagan said that any scientific knowledge that Dogen had obviously came from a modern visitor. Well, we've got two problems with that viewpoint. The first is that string theory wasn't developed until 1980, and Marcel Griot, who documented it, died in 1956. So how did, how, which modern visitor told the Dogen about string theory before 1956? The, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the second problem is whoever gave that information to the Doga and apparently documented it for them using ancient Egyptian words. Now, which, which modern visitor are we going to propose documented that stuff for them using ancient Egyptian words? And I've been able to trace uh, virtually every important cosmological word of the Dogen to an Egyptian counterpart, a likely Egyptian counterpart based on pronunciation, multiple levels of meaning, and shared drawn symbols.
um, they are known, in the 1500s, it's known that they moved from the Niger River to the cliffs. And it's surmised that they did that to avoid um, assimilation into Islam. Um, again, it's not documented that that's true. I mean, they can't prove that that's true, but that's, that's what the feeling is, the traditional feeling is. So the fact that they moved to avoid assimilation is one of the things that has prevented them from being assimilated. But if you think of the fact that the Dogen culture is the best living example we have of the Egyptian um, cultural system, we know for, for absolutely certain that the Egyptian cultural system uh, held together in fairly coherent form for 3,000 years. So it's not so much to think that it could have held together for another 2,000. A question up here? Okay, um, if I, I've um, had to deal with the question of where, where this knowledge came from. Um, if someone put a gun to my head and said, time's up now, you gotta tell me what you think. No more research, what do you think happened here? Based on what the Dogen say, the Dogen say that they received their cosmology as a way of teaching them about skills of civilization from what they call ancestor teachers. And those teachers are associated with the stars of Sirius. Okay? If you go to Egypt, the Egyptians tell us that their written language was a gift to them from their ancestor gods, and the Egyptian word for teacher is pronounced like the Egyptian word for. If you go to Buddhism, Buddhists tell us that the most sacred of their symbols, which are the ones that line up with these symbols, were given to them by a non-human source. So what it looks to me is as if someone who knew an awful lot about science um, essentially performed a Peace Corps effort to help us all get a leg up on civilization. And uh, <laughs> if I had to guess, I'd say that's what had happened. But that's not really the focus of the book. The focus of the books are to lay out what the relationships are between Dogen myths and science and between Dogen cosmological shapes and Egyptian language. As it turns out, there is a relationship between each Egyptian, okay, let's start over. There are 4, 000, about 4,000 Egyptian glyphs. Of those 4,000, only a handful have what are called direct phonetic values, the way you would think of a, a letter in English having a phonetic value. And the ones that do have direct phonetic values are the ones that relate back to the cosmology. Um, for each of these uh, Egyptian glyphs that has a phonetic value, it turns out, no one has noticed over all these years, that there's also an Egyptian god or goddess whose name is pronounced like the glyph. For example, the, the phonetic value N or NU is associated with wave glyphs in Egypt. The word Nu means water among the Dogen. And there's an Egyptian goddess Nu who represents the goddess of the primeval waters from which everything came. When you're laying out the structure of matter for the Dogen, or you, as it turns out, you can also lay it out in terms of Egyptian glyphs, um, the uh, wave glyph correlates to waves in, in physics, that when you go far enough down in physics in the structure of matter, matter behaves like a wave. And so you can take the Egyptian glyph, find the Egyptian god or goddess whose name is pronounced like the glyph, and the traditional role of the Egyptian god or goddess will tell you outright what component of matter the glyph represents. Once you figure that out, it's a matter of about two hours worth of effort to lay out an entire structure of matter from bottom to top, from waves to atom, using Egyptian glyphs and demonstrating that it's right by uh, correlating that with the traditional role of the Egyptian god or goddess. In other words, the Egyptian hieroglyphic language is a designed language and we can prove it three or four different ways, or we can demonstrate it three or four different ways. That goes along with an explicit tradition in ancient Egypt that their written language was given to them by their ancestor teachers or ancestor gods. And you go around the world to other cultures, and again, again, and again, the cultures say, oh, by the way, our written language was given to us by our teachers, and oh, by the way, we learned our organizing skills from ancestor teachers. And so, um, Critics will come along and say, well, you can't trust what these ancient 
civilizations say, they, they can make up any old thing. How can you believe it? It's like talking to you know, a four-year-old. Um, you can't really lend credibility to it. Well, that would be true if they were all making up different stories. But the fact is, they're all telling us the same story. They're all saying, we got this from knowledgeable teachers who helped us figure out how to be civilized. Um, another comparison I make is, imagine that um, four four-year-olds are playing in a nursery and a gunman runs in and shoots their, their daycare worker dead. Now, you can't rely on the testimony of a four-year-old to tell you who committed the crime. But if all four four-year-olds are telling you that a tall, red-headed man with a beard was the one who did it, the police ought to be out there looking for a tall, red-headed man. And so that's what I'm doing with uh, the, uh, the comparative cosmology, is I'm finding these areas where all the cultures are telling us the same story, and then making the presumption, as a programmer does, that that is the likely truth, and then following that truth to see if I can demonstrate that it's right. So we're back to our um, egg in the ball shape. This is the Egyptian sun glyph shape, essentially. Water, fire, wind, and earth will find our four phases of the formation of mass in science. Um, OK, Ama is the central egg. Um, the Egyptian and Neid gods and goddesses are pairs of uh, Dogen um, seeds or signs that are associated with each of the four elements. Um, the, those pairs of signs um, correlate to opposing aspects of their elements. So um, for water, it's water and dryness. For fire, it's light and darkness. Or from another viewpoint, it's fire and wood. Wood is what fire burns. Um, it's wind and still air, and it's earth, which in the concept of cosmology is a, a keyword for mass, and what's called imperial sky, which is a keyword for space. Okay, now in um, stupa symbolism, uh, this is documented by Adrian Snodgrass, who's a leading authority on Buddhist architecture and symbolism. He's out of uh, the University of um, West Sydney, Australia. Um, the first stage in building this stupa involves a stick and an empty field, which is pretty much the only tools that someone who was trying to come in and do a peace choreography could count on their students having access to. And you st what happens is you stick the stick in the ground, and you draw a circle around it, and you mark the two longest shadows of the day, uh, morning and evening, at the points where they intersect the circle, and then draw a line between those two points. OK, that line will automatically be oriented in an east-west direction. So now you have an aligned structure. Then there are some other, other steps they go through, simple geometric steps to be able to produce an axis that's aligned north and south. OK, this shape is essentially a sundial. And when you look at this figure, which is the figure of the Egyptian sun glyph, in terms of a sundial, it represents it, it's, it's the tool that allows you to track the hours of the day. And the figure is a gen essentially generated by the series of shadows that are created by the sun um, caused by the rotation of the earth in the relationship to the sun. So the figure represents the sun. It represents the concept of a day. And it also um, represents what, um, the rotation of the earth in relationship to the sun. This is in terms of cosmology. Um, now, the next thing is that those two points uh, that they marked based on the longest shadows of the day, uh, the line they draw between those two points will pass through the stick on two days of the year. Those are the, the equinoxes. And the line will continue to move progressively farther away from the stick every day of the year until you hit a solstice. And then it'll move back. So the same figure that allows you to track the hours of the day using a stick and a circle will also allow you to track the motions of the sun and figure out when the solstices and equinoxes are and figure out when the, you know, where the seasons are. So from this standpoint, the figure represents a period of time, just like the Egyptian Egyptologists say. Um, but the way you derive the figure from this conceptual framework is it's the Yes, so it's a product of the progression of the, of the intersecting points. 
if you were to follow those every day of the year throughout the year, the culmination of those intersecting points would produce the circle with the point in the middle of it. And so in that way, the uh, figure represents the orbit of the Earth around the sun. OK, now you remember back when we were talking about electrons that the nest shape, which is the picture of an electron orbit, is the symbol that the uh, Dogen chose to represent an electron. It's the, the documented shape that you can observe in nature um, caused by the component of matter that represents the component. Um, so what they've done in terms of the Egyptian glyph shape is exactly the same thing. They've used a picture of an orbit to represent uh, the concept of an orbit. OK, um, in traditional Egyptology, the glyph shape, the sun glyph shape represents the sun. It can represent the concept of a day. And in a word, it can indicate a period of time. The traditional Egyptologists don't provide us with an explanation of why. But you can see that if we start with the cosmology, we can explain all of those meanings in terms of that shape. OK. Um, OK, so the bottom line is that an Egyptian word doesn't work the same way as an English word does. Um, I read a biological or biographical sketch of Champollion recently that said that he was delayed for a significant amount of time in producing his translation of the Rosetta Stone because, in the word of the article, he stubbornly clung to the idea that a glyph might represent something more than a phonetic value. So Egyptian from my perspective, don't work like the word dog. They more work more like um, an acronym in, in English, like FYI, which means for your information. And if you substitute a concept for glyph, you produce a symbolic sentence. And the symbolic sentence tells you the meaning of the word. So let's see if we can get up to, here's the example of the Egyptian word for week. It's written with two glyphs, the sun glyph and the number 10. And the way I read the word is, a day 10 times, or to put it in proper English, 10 days. Now, another, another drawback to my approach is, I have been talking about that we know for certain how the Dogen pronounce their words. Um, we don't know for certain how the Egyptians pronounce theirs. But as it turns out, the Dogen pronounce their words just like Wallace Budge pronounced it in his dictionary. And this is a problem because traditional Egyptologists have rejected Budge's dictionary as being out of date and inaccurate, a number of other things. From my standpoint, all I'm trying to do is correlate African words to Egyptian words, and Budge's dictionary does that consistently. Predictively, I can take a Dogen word and say I'm going to find it in Budge's dictionary. So to my way of thinking, Budge cannot be wholly wrong about Egyptian language and yet still be in predictive agreement with the Dogen. I'm not trying to rehabilitate Budge's dictionary, but I am saying that some of the objections to the way he pronounces his words need to be revisited. Um, OK, so then I moved on to other concepts of time. I said, if they've defined a, the Egyptians have defined a week as being 10 days, what happens when we look at the concept of a day? So, this is how the word day reads according to my method. It says, rotation of the Earth in relationship to the sun. Uh, turns out the same word can also be written with just the sun glyph, which is how the sun glyph in Egyptian language takes on the meaning of day. Um, the Egyptian word for year reads, it's, it's written with two glyphs, the time glyph, which is the first glyph, and the sun glyph. It reads, the time of the Earth's orbit around the sun. It's the definition of a year. The word for seasons reads three, three arcs of the Earth's orbit around the sun. The word month reads the moon makes an orbit. So time and again with Egyptian words, uh, my, my second book, which is available here, lays out, I, I've lost count of the number of Egyptian words, word examples like this where the, the meaning of the word um, is directly explained by the glyphs that are used to write it. Um, 
it becomes more interesting when we start getting into words that relate to astrophysics. Let's see if we get some of those here. Okay, um, in Buddhism, as we're building this stupa, the, the idea is that we're evoking an ordered shape from a disordered field. And the ordered shape, the ordered space that we're evoking is a square base that events, eventually gets drawn on the stupa ge through geometric um, um, machinations in the, in the building of the stupa. So for Buddhism, that shape of the square, that is Buddhist stupa symbolism, the shape of the square represents the concept of space. Come to the Egyptian word for dawn, and you read it the alternate way, and it says, caused or created by the rotation in space of the Earth in relation to the sun. It's a scientific definition of what dawn is. Um, okay, now we get into concepts of astrophysics. Uh, what if we talk about the concept of light? Um, to get to this is a little more tricky because there's debate among Egyptologists as to what the third glyph shape up there represents. For, for the Egyptologists, uh, for Budge it represents um, a sieve. And a sieve is a very important cosmological concept for um, the Dogen. It, um, the Dogen use a sieve to, well, they preserve their beans by covering them with sand and then when they want to use the beans, they use the sieve to separate the wave-like sand from the particle-like beans. And so the sieve becomes a symbol of three different things. It can mean source, the way that uh, the sieve becomes the source of beans. It can mean, uh, or the source of the sand. It can mean product, which is the, the beans. And it can mean uh, limit, which is the effect that separates the sand from the beans. Um, another viewpoint might be that that glyph represents a pool of water, and I found Egyptian words that justify that interpretation for the glyph, that um, words whose meanings have to do with pools of water um, being written with that glyph. But in essence, for me, that glyph represents the concept of either source, limit, or result or product. And so the word for light reads, that which comes to be the limit, followed by the light glyph. Now, this is the next uh, interesting thing about Egyptian language. Um, there's, there are words like this throughout the Egyptian language where there are turn, it turns out there's a trailing glyph on the end of the word that doesn't get pronounced. And the traditional Egyptologists have said, well, that, that is, because the, glyphs, the, the trailing glyph seems to be connected to the meaning of the word, and so it's drawn into the word for emphasis as a determinative. It's there just for emphasis. I say, looking at this word, that like glyph at the end of the word is not there for emphasis. It's there because the word defines the meaning of the glyph. And once you realize that, now you can use the Egyptian hieroglyphic language to tell you what its own glyphs mean. All you have to do is go find the defining word. And the way you recognize the defining word is it, the word expresses the meaning of the glyph that's being defined and the glyph appears as the final, final non-determinative glyph of the word. And as it turns out, there are, there are actually four or five different categories of defining words. This is the simplest category. The word, which uh, Egyptian word for light, A-A-K-H-U, corresponds to a Dogon word for light, which is pronounced Ogo, O-G-O. The Egyptian word for time says, okay, um, get back to the stupa symbolism. The um, pyramid-like shape that's on the top of the Dogen granary and is, at the, uh, is the, the dome of the stupa um, correlates for the Dogen, in Dogen cosmology, to the concept of mass or matter. For the stupa symbolism, it represents the concept of essence or substance. And so I've got agreement... Um, general agreement between the two cosmologies that that shape represents mass or matter, the hemisphere shape. And so based on that, I interpret the word for time to say that which mass bends or warps, followed by the time glyph. And so it's a definition that could be right out of Einstein, who says that mass bends time. 
Um, this is an example of another kind of Egyptian defining word. I call it an enumerating definition. It's trying to define the concept of a force, which is represented by the bent arm. Um, the way they define the concept of a force is they give us examples of the three kinds of forces. There are bending warping forces. There are weaving or, I mean, there are drawing forces. Drawing is a metaphor in the cosmology for, um, for binding something together. And that there are weaving forces, like the electromagnetic force. And so this is defining the concept of a force generally by giving us three examples of what a force is. The Egyptian word to fall down, I take as a definition for gravity. It says, the result, product, or effect of the bending warping force, followed by a picture of a fall. Um, okay, I was trying to, I was searching for an explanation for what causes an orbit. I thought, as long as I've got these Egyptian definitions here, I, I might be able to learn some things I don't know about science. What do you suppose causes an orbit? And I thought, well, I know that the Egyptian sun glyph seems to, to represent a picture of an orbit, that if I'm going to find a word that defines what causes an orbit, it's going to show that sun glyph as the final glyph of the word. And what I ended up coming up with was a word pronounced ether, which is the Greek concept of the fluidic substance that fills all the space between the planets and the stars. In other words, the equivalent of Einstein's space-time. And so the word ether says to me, um, mass bends time. I thought, well, Einstein said mass bends space-time, not time. How do you know that difference? You know, Egypt is telling me, the Egyptians are telling me it's, it's purely time. It, there's no concept of space-time. It's time that's being warped. Then I realized that Einstein has a, there's a, there's a caveat to his theories that says that gravity in an accelerating time frame has got to, to be indistinguishable from gravity in a gravitating time frame. Now, Einstein already told us himself that when you accelerate a body, you slow down time. In other words, he's telling us in terms of acceleration that mass bends time. Then for gravity to be indistinguishable from acceleration, gravity also has to bend time. Here's the concept of acceleration in Egyptian language. It says, the bending caused by an increase in mass comes to be limited by the taking away of the strength of or piece of time. And that's E equals mc squared. So um, as part of my research for a, a third book that I'm, I had been considering writing, I was looking for a concise definition of what a symbol is. I thought. Um, how can I explain this in a way that, that really hits the nail on the head as to what a symbol is supposed to be? And it finally occurred to me, go to the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Dictionary, see how they define a symbol. And I found two words for symbol. One, when you read it my way, says, um, action preserves knowledge. The second says, action replicates knowledge. But that's pretty good. The one that means action preserves knowledge is pronounced Hashem, which is the Hebrew word that's substituted for the name of God as a symbol. So there, um, over and over again, I found connections to Hebrew words where I, find, I understand the meaning of the Hebrew word because of the way that the Egyptian word happens to be written. But anyway, so the, uh, the, the ultimate conclusion I come to is the Egyptian hieroglyphic language was a design, design language, which means the Egyptians were telling us the truth when they said their ancestor gods gave them the written language. Um, I conclude that cosmology preceded written language and that key Egyptian glyph shapes came out of the cosmology. I can walk you through the same process with several other Egyptian glyph shapes and show how the stupa form ends up creating both the symbol and the meaning, the shape of the symbol and the meaning and then demonstrate how those play out in Egyptian language. So my book, Sacred Symbols of the Dogon, um, walks you through all of this, and it provides you with better justification for why I think a particular glyph means what it means, and uh, shows you the, um, 
how you can lay out the structure of matter using just Egyptian glyphs. Uh, it provides you with dozens and dozens of examples of Egyptian words that work the way I say they work. And uh, that's, that's really the presentation. Um, at this point, I think uh, I'll open the floor to uh, questions. I'm sure that anybody who's familiar with the traditional view of Egyptian language uh, is going to have some. And um, we have a mic here that um, can be used. We have a question over here. What is the name? Larry? Yes. Uh, are you familiar with the history of West Africa prior to the colonial period, the um, European invasions of the Africans? Only, only vaguely. I've never studied it in detail, no. Okay. There were several empires in West Africa prior to the European, what do you call it, uh, colonialization, invasion of the continent. Right. And uh, they were Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. And uh, in African studies, of course, we have the information that the Dogon were part of the Mali and Songhai empires, okay. so that when the Arabs and the Europeans were overrunning and destroying that civilization, they, as you said, were the unassimilable. They refused to accept the contamination of the Europeans and the Arabs. Right. So they were forced into the condition they are now, materially impoverished, but culturally and, and knowledge-wise, they carry the information from the ancient Egyptians. Okay. Now, they claim that they are, in fact, descendants of the ancient Egyptians. Who claims? The Dogon. The Dogon themselves do. I hadn't the, seen that documented that they actually made the claim. Yeah, I wanted to, to share some other information. If you read uh, African uh, scholar uh, Sheikh Anta Diop, D I O P, right. he has done a lot of work in that area. And I think uh, the book called um, Pre Colonial Black Africa right. would be a book that you want to look at. And um, let's see, I'm trying to think, there are some other scholars that have done some research there. But historically, what happened is the ancient Egyptians, when, they, when the empire or the civilization was beginning to crumble as a result of the invasion, mm -hmm. uh, toward the end of their tenures, first the uh, Assyrians, in the 600 BC era, then it was the uh, Persians, then it was the Greeks mm -hmm. and the Romans in succession. Mm -hmm. These various civilizations all took over the Egyptian civilization at different points in time toward the end of the ancient era. And the last invaders were the Arabs who came in under Islam during the 6th century AD. And what the result of these successive invasions were is that many of the Egyptians accepted the assimilation, others fled to the south or were pushed to the south and the west. Mm -hmm. So that if what ended up happening is that as the Egyptian civilization was falling, you had the popping up of other civilizations south of Egypt in, and west of Egypt. I think the Ghana civilization uh, occurred, was occurring at the same time Egypt was falling. And you see this from Ghana to Mali to Songhai, this south and westward movement, right. so that in fact the Dogon are the descendants of the ancient Egyptians, as other Africans were, as they were pushed to the south right. and to the west by the invaders from the north. Well, and so, any evidence that, that actually can prove that um, helps my point. Um, yes. Well, I, I've tried to make my approach to it not be contingent or dependent on that being proved or disproven. Right, but I was going to say uh, Diop, uh, who was a Senegalese West African, right. was also educated in France, and so a lot of his works were in French originally. He put out a dictionary, um, I can't remember the exact title, but I'm sure you as a scholar would be able to locate it, 
in which he shows that in his West African language, Senegalese, mm -hmm. which is in West Africa, in that same area where those empires existed, right. he shows that 2,000, he has a dictionary of 2,000 words in Senegalese and 2,000 words in ancient Egyptian, and in fact, they are exactly identical. Right. So that he also presented his evidence in 1974 at a conference in Cairo showing that, in fact, ancient Egyptian was an African language and not a, quote, Mideastern or anything else. And the other scholars from Europe who were there were unable to um, prove that he was wrong. Right, well, I, so, I agree that... So that's, that's some connections I just wanted to give you between I, the Dogon and... I agree and that there are, there are uh, fundamental African connections and pre-dynastic connections that are fundamentally African um, uh, that, that um, strongly influence Egypt. And um, I'm hoping that my work with Dogon cosmology and language will help demonstrate what the relationships are back to some of the Egyptian symbols. Thank you very much, Laird. That was fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, good stuff. Really good stuff. Lunch is being served.